questa conferenza che diciamo, avvia un po' i nostri incontri serali di questa festa di scienza e filosofia. Devo subito iniziare che, a dire che il successo della precedente edizione della festa di scienza e filosofia ci ha posto nelle condizioni di un salto di qualità che è rilevabile su due aspetti. Il primo è il notevole ampliamento delle conferenze e delle attività connesse al tema di quest'anno, cioè scienza, ricerca e sviluppo, con un numero considerevole di ospiti di primo piano nel campo della ricerca e del pensiero contemporaneo e poi in secondo luogo l'aver dato una connotazione internazionale a questo nostro evento. Certamente molti dei nostri relatori si muovono in, questo, in questa dimensione internazionale, ma il fatto di avere qui con noi uno straniero che è una delle personalità più autorevoli al mondo, se vuoi dire, nel, nel suo campo, certamente dà ai nostri incontri uno spessore particolare e suggella anche l'alto profilo della nostra festa che si pone certamente in un contesto che va ben oltre il nostro territorio. Ecco, desidero esprimere al nome del laboratorio di scienze sperimentali che rappresento, certo anche di farmi interprete del sentimento anche degli altri rappresentanti delle altre istituzioni che hanno sostenuto questo nostro evento, ecco, rivolgo al professor John Harris il nostro benvenuto e anche un profondo ringraziamento per aver accolto il nostro invito e per tutto quello che con il suo intervento ci vorrà offrire in termini di scienza e di evoluzione del pensiero. Chi è John Harris? John Harris è uno dei massimi esperti in bioetica. Bioetica, forse sapete tutti, che è un neologismo che è stato coniato negli anni 70, quando è stata spianata la strada alla diffusione in quest'ambito, caratterizzato da una matrice interdisciplinare dove la biologia, la medicina, il diritto e anche la filosofia morale alimentano approfondimenti, dibattiti e confronti su tematiche che emergono insieme agli straordinari progressi della scienza, in particolar modo in ambito biologico. Ci si è, posto, si è così aperti anche a condizioni e opportunità del tutto nuove, scuotendo la stabilità anche dei nostri principi morali, che sono la base delle nostre identità culturali. I problemi che determinano l'attuale dibattito bioetico, e ne elenco alcuni tra i più importanti, cioè la procreazione assistita, l'uso delle cellule staminali, le manipolazioni genetiche, la sperimentazione medica in genere, ma anche e soprattutto l'eutanasia e la definizione dello status giuridico e ontologico dell'embrione, portano anche a ridisegnare gran parte del nostro sistema valoriale, con implicazioni di carattere ideologico, sociale, religioso e legislativo. John Harris è stato al centro dell'attenzione per le sue opinioni su temi emergenti e che appaiono a prima vista inquietanti, ma che certamente necessitano di un approfondimento e un, un confronto approfondito, sereno ma anche autorevole. Io elenco alcuni di questi, di questi temi. Uno, la medicina rigenerativa e l'allungamento della vita, il mercato etico degli organi, l'eutanasia neonatale, il potenziamento delle performance cognitive, l'ingegneria genetica e le generazioni future. John Harris è professore di bioetica a Manchester, dove è anche direttore dell'Istituto per la Scienza, l'Etica e l'Innovazione ed è anche direttore del programma strategico Benvenuti nel Corpo Umano e membro del Comitato di Etica Medica della British Medical Association ed è stato anche membro della Commissione per la Genetica Umana del Regno Unito. Il giornale inglese The Independent 
l'ha inserito tra le 50 persone che rendono migliore il mondo, poi capiremo perché da quello che ci dirà naturalmente, influenzando anche il nostro modo di vita, i nostri stili di vita e il nostro modo di essere. I campi di interesse spaziano dalla posizione morale e politica dei bambini all'allocazione delle risorse pubbliche, all'etica dell'assistenza sanitaria. Naturalmente ha pubblicato moltissime, moltissimi articoli e libri, per la verità abbiamo poco in lingua italiana. Nel 1994, quindi un libro un po' datato, da, da Baldini e Castoldi ha pubblicato uno dei suoi libri più famosi, più importanti, che, che ha questo titolo, Wonder Woman e Superman, ha per sottotitolo Manipolazione genetica e futuro dell'uomo. Qui l'autore espone le sue idee su quelle che dovrebbe essere un obbligo di utilizzo dei progressi scientifici a vantaggio delle generazioni a venire. Quindi ritengo che questo sia inerente a quello che John Harris ha posto anche a titolo della sua conferenza, cioè a che serve la scienza. Ecco, John Harris parlerà per circa 40 minuti, naturalmente parlerà in inglese come sapete e quindi abbiamo la traduzione e l'interpretazione simultanea, poi c'è la possibilità di interventi che immagino ne solleciterà diversi e quindi sarà disponibile per rispondere a tutte le sollecitazioni che verranno avanzate. Grazie. Thank you very much for that more than generous welcome. It is wonderful to be here in Foligno for me for the first time. Uh, not the first time in Italy, of course, but the first time in this city. And it is particularly pleasing because, of course, Italy has the nicest people, the best food, wonderful weather, and, of course, also the Mediterranean timekeeping. And I apologize to you all for the lateness of the start of this presentation. But that is the one thing beyond my control. Um, it's a great honor to have been invited to this wonderful conference. I'm already enjoying myself immensely. I should issue a health warning. I am a philosopher by training, and that means one important thing. I use no visual aids that were not familiar to Plato. Now, those of you who know your Plato well will know that Plato did use visual aids, but they involved a large fire and a deep cave. And I found that when I asked my hosts here in Foligno to provide these visual aids for me, they were unable to do so. So I apologize for that. Uh, I should also say that this paper was jointly written by myself and my colleague and friend John Salston, who some of you will know um, won the Nobel Prize for Medicine and Physiology in 2002 for his work on sequencing uh, the genome of actually the, uh, uh, a worm, uh, C. elegans, but also for noticing while he was sequencing that genome uh, the phenomenon which is now known as programmed cell death, and he also led the, uh, the public uh, part of the Human Genome Project in England. Now, why I mention this is because since we jointly wrote this paper, I just want to make it clear that all the good bits are mine and all the rubbish belongs to John Salston. <laughs> so if there are any errors, they're his fault. Uh, finally, uh, From the introduction, I should just make clear that you were kind enough to mention something from the independent newspaper. Don't believe all that you read in the newspapers. Okay, my theme this evening is the question, what is science for? And in the many years that uh, John Salston and I have been friends, we have always disagreed about the answer to this question. Because for John, science is curiosity driven and it leads where it leads. For me, science has a public and a moral purpose. And what I want to talk about this evening is not only that purpose, that justification, 
but also why it is science is effectively our last hope. Truly speaking, our last hope. I hope we won't need it, but I fear that we might. I want to offer you to start with two propositions, which I will treat as true, but I shall not argue for them because I'm not a scientist. The first proposition is that in the future, there will be no more human beings. We may be almost the last of our species. But I find that a comforting thought for reasons that I will come to in a moment. This proposition is not one of the things we should be worried about. The second proposition I want to offer you is that in the future there will be no more planet Earth. This is certainly true, at least as certainly true as any claim of fact can possibly be when it relates to the future. But I want to suggest to you that while that is something to worry about, we don't have to worry about it too much yet. But both of those facts, that we are probably among the last of our race and we are inhabiting a doomed planet, are very important things to think about. In both of these cases, I believe it is to science that we must look for help in palliating the worst effects. But there are more pressing problems. Some of you may know um, a very interesting book by Martin Rees. Now, Martin Rees uh, was, when he wrote this book, the Astronomer Royal and the President of the Royal Society, our National Academy for Science in the United Kingdom. And the book is called Our Final Century, Our Last 100 Years. And Martin Rees, a very eminent scientist, very responsible person, seriously advances the hypothesis that it could well be that the end of this earth and the end of us is much nearer than even I believe it likely to be. Rees has in mind a number of possibilities, among them climate change, the possibility of meteorites striking the earth, and, of course, the occurrence of new diseases, diseases like uh, variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, AIDS, and H5N1, which is the variant of the flu virus that may mutate into human form. And if there is time at the end, I will come back to that. If we, are, we humans are to combat these dangers we will need to change. We will need to change the way we think and the way we act and behave. We will need to become smarter. We will need to be eventually more resistant to disease, healthier, and we will most importantly need to be more creative and more inventive. We will need, in short, to radically enhance ourselves. Now, this is a theme that I have thought about for many years. I've, uh, my last book, which was called Enhancing Evolution, was the third book that I have written about the phenomenon of human enhancement, the possibilities that we humans have for making ourselves better, more effective, in every way possible. We will need, in short, eventually, and that may not be very long, to be clever enough to find another planet to live on, or maybe even clever enough to manufacture such a planet so that we can live on it. We're in about a billion years, but you know, what's that between friends? Not a long time. We will also need to be clever enough 
to survive long enough to acquire the technology to do that. And that is a really big issue for the reasons that Martin Rees and many other people recently have talked about. How will we manage all of these things? Well, I think, and I'm not a scientist, I'm a philosopher, I think our best bet is science. Shakespeare also makes a great thing of science. But he doesn't call it science, he calls it magic. When I was an undergraduate many years ago, my philosophy tutor was fond of saying, science is just magic that works. It's just magic that is more reliable than magic normally is, more effective than magic normally is. Shakespeare also writes a lot about Italy and Italians. Let's start with one of his plays, The Tempest, La Tempesta. In that play, Miranda, young woman, brought up in the company of her father, Prospero, a magician, and assorted magical beings, sees ordinary men for the first time. She's a high-spirited, attractive young woman, and she suddenly sees ordinary men for the first time, and she likes what she sees. This is what she says. Oh, wonder, how many goodly creatures are there here? How beauteous mankind is. Oh, brave new world that has such people in it. Miranda can be seen as celebrating the discovery for the first time of her own kind, other human beings. A celebration of humanity. But I think she sees a deeper truth. The only men she has encountered up to this point in the play, besides her father, are the magical, intangible Ariel, and the loathsome, ugly, and pitiable Caliban. Not much of a choice for a high-spirited young woman. Suddenly, she encounters young, good-looking, and as it happens, Italian men for the first time. And her world is changed. She is not so much confirming a species preference, in my view, a preference for her own kind, she is welcoming what she sees to be, believes to be, a brave new world. Miranda's quotidian world is magical. She chooses, consciously, a better but less familiar world. I believe that that is our fate also. We have to have the courage to decide what a better world will look like and to choose it. In the future, not too distant future, in fact it's already here, there will be all kinds of new creatures in our world, the world that we're all familiar with. And I believe that it will be our business, our occupation, to ensure that they are all as good as we can make them. Some will be man-made or person-made, if you're gender conscious, resulting from something more akin to construction than sexual reproduction. They may result from synthetic biology or synthetic gametes, but however synthetic their origins may be, they will be real in every important sense. Some other creatures will be interspecies embryos, or rather creatures resulting perhaps from the interspecies embryos that already exist. But eventually, interspecies creatures will grow to term and run about on the carpet and possibly frighten the horses. 
Some will be enhanced humans, others may well be enhanced animals. Other creatures will be mixtures, not of human and animal genes or parts, but perhaps humans with technology implanted. Not like the heart pacemakers that we are already familiar with, or the prosthetic limbs that perhaps even some people in this room already have. I have a body full of bits of metal because I spent too much time playing sports when I was younger. But more likely, and more interestingly, perhaps tiny nanobots, pieces of high-tech that will dramatically enhance mental as well as physical powers. As an aside, it seems to me highly ironic, humorous, that we humans agonize endlessly about the loss of randomly created species. We're very worried about the dwindling number of species of creatures there are in the world. But we are very unwilling to add to those species by creating new ones ourselves. This seems to me to be irrational. I want to suggest to you that it is just as well, that it is good that there are possibilities for new sorts of beings. Because in the future, it is likely, as I've said, that we are likely, that we are, will have to face the end of our own species. One of the most dramatic and important of the new technologies that will produce new creatures is so-called synthetic biology. Synthetic biology, as many of you will know, is the name now used for a cluster of new technologies in which biomolecular components, natural or synthetic, are newly combined or reorganized in order to create novel genetic, biochemical circuitry, pathways, and ultimately organisms. It may be thought of, a hi of as a hybrid discipline between science and engineering. Synthetic biology has attracted the newspapers and the headlines and has caught popular imagination because it marks the beginning of what looks like the possibility of manufacturing life forms literally from scratch and eventually creating tailor-made creatures in our own image or in principle in the image of anything that we want to copy. Some of you will have read rather inflated claims by Craig Venter that he's already created synthetic life. I'm skeptical about those claims for reasons that are beyond the subject of these lectures, but it will happen. I don't think he's done it, but it will happen. Many people believe that we humans have been made in the image of God by a God who presumably likes the way she looks. Is it vanity that makes the prospect of such a thing, however remote, look so unattractive and daunting? Vanity may be an unpleasant personal trait. I am guilty of it. Perhaps some of you even are guilty of vanity. But it's hardly a decisive moral objection. Many of us are vain, but we are not, I think, objectionable, although we may not be nice on that account. Is synthetic biology one of the things we should be worried about? I want now to, just for a moment, ask a different question, but it is, will help us to answer this question. And it's a very deep question. Does being human matter? Is it important that there are human beings? When we identify humanity, not simply with species membership, with being human, but with being moral, we may be claiming one of two very different things. The first thing that we might be claiming is that we humans, members of the species Homo sapiens sapiens, are characterized by, among other qualities, moral agency and other important features like sympathy, empathy, creativity, high intelligence, and so on. But we may be claiming something else. We may be claiming that the possession of qualities like these is essentially human. 
possessed by us only because we are the species that we are. This second sense implies that our humanity in the moral, in the evaluative sense, is not simply species typical, but species essential, requiring being human in the biological or genetic sense as a necessary condition. It seems to me that there is a big danger here, that there is a long-established and deeply ingrained habit of identifying properties that we share, but which are only contingently possessed, accidentally possessed by our species, and not necessarily our right, our prerogative, and our inheritance uniquely. Kinds of individuals, other than humans, of whatever nature, who possess the characteristics that enable them not only to have a life, but to be aware, to know that they have a life, have, at least since the 17th century, since the late great English philosopher John Locke, been termed as a term of art, as a technical term, persons. So long as persons continue to exist, I believe that we don't have to worry too much about whether or not they are human persons. What matters is not that there will be humans in the future, but that there will be self-conscious, intelligent beings in the future, whether they are human or not. What matters then, in my view, is not being human, but the existence of beings that have those powers and capacities that make life worthwhile. I could ask you now, write down, I do this with my students, write down now, either in your imagination or on your iPads, the 20 things that make life worth living for you. Nobody does it. It is a terrible humiliation for me that at this point I have to confess that I have no authority whatsoever as a teacher because nobody ever does this. But what interests me about us, people like you and me, is that you could do it. If you could get over the sense of ridiculousness, you could do that. Why? Because there are things that make life worth living for you. At least I hope there are. And if you, as I say, could get over the sense of the ridiculous, you could probably list what they are. Let me turn aside for a moment to a, another reminder that I would like to issue. And this comes from uh, the English evolutionary biologist and popularizer of science, Richard Dawkins. Have any of you read his essay, Gaps in the Mind, Spaces in the Mind? It's a wonderful essay. I'm going to just tell you a little bit of it now. He asks us to imagine a human woman today standing on the coast of Africa. I'm going to act this out. So here she is, standing on the coast of Africa. There's the sea. There's the continent. Italy's up there. She's looking north. She's standing on the coast of Africa. And in her right hand, she's holding the hand of her mother. And her mother, in her right hand, I'm going to fall off the edge here in a moment, is holding the hand of her mother. And so on, in a human chain, back across the continent of Africa. Each woman looks as much like a mother and daughter as mothers and daughters usually do. And in just 500 kilometers, each woman taking up about a meter of space, we come to our common ape ancestor. Only about 500 kilometers into Africa. You hardly notice it on the map. Africa is so big. In about 5 million years, but let's not worry about the time. And our common ape ancestor is holding her daughter's hand in one hand and her other daughter's hand in the other. And they are forming another human chain in parallel back to the coast. And by the time they get back to the coast, we have two contemporary women 
I'm using women because the biology is simpler. Um, the inheritance is simpler. Uh, we have two contemporary women facing one another on the coast of Africa. One, the contemporary human woman with whom we started, and the other, a contemporary chimpanzee. That is the truth about biology, which you all know, about evolutionary biology. Not that we are descended from chimpanzees, that chimpanzees and ourselves are descended from a common ape ancestor. And the defining characteristic of a species, the fact that we can breed with one another, but not without the aid of technology with chimpanzees, is just an accident of evolution. The apes that we could have bred with have died out, but the chimpanzees have not. Now, this tells us a number of very important things. But for my present purposes, it tells us this. That fixing evolution at a particular point is not a great idea. Imagine our common ape ancestors getting together 500 miles into uh, Africa, somewhere in the Congo, perhaps. They're getting together and they're looking at each other like we're looking at each other now. And they're saying, isn't this great? Simian nature. Let's hang on to it. Let's make sure that we don't further evolve into something else. Well, I, for one, am very pleased that our ape ancestors lacked the imagination or the language or the ability to get together and legally put a stop to further evolution or to interbreeding with other species. I'm very pleased they didn't, because if they had have done that, you and I wouldn't have been having this very agreeable conversation this evening. I don't think we should do that either. I think we should be open to species change. Indeed, I think it is our only likely salvation in any event I believe it to be inevitable, but it will not happen through further Darwinian evolution. It will happen by what I called in my last book enhancement evolution, deliberately chosen evolution by people like us. Okay. Where does this leave us? Well, if I can find out where it leaves us. The desire of ourselves to be better is part of the curiosity and the need that drives science itself. One of the oldest and most valuable things that characterize our species in its current form is that we are into human enhancement. We're into improvement. We're into self-improvement. We want to be better. We want to live longer. We want to be healthier. And we want to do the same for our children. Let me invite you to consider another enhancement technology. People are worried about enhancement, but we humans have always been doing it. We're into synthetic technologies that make things better. And the one I want to ask you to consider is something in which all of us are bathed as I speak to you now. We are bathed in synthetic sunshine. That's what enables me to see you and you to see me. Before synthetic sunshine, we humans and our ancestors had to go to sleep when it became dark and we could work and play when the sun rose. But thanks to the advent of synthetic sunshine, firelight, candlelight, lamplight, electric light, work and play could go on through the night. And it was a very problematic technology in all the ways that new technologies are today. It was expensive. It was elitist. It allowed some human beings to get an advantage, an unfair advantage, over others. I don't know whether you have this expression in Italian, but in English we have the expression, the game is not worth the candle. 
And that ari- the arises from cafe culture, from pub culture in my country, cafe culture in yours, where people would go to a bar and play cards or dominoes or dice and gamble, and they would need to do so by the light of a candle. And that candle cost money, a lot of money. It was expensive. So you had to decide whether the game was worth the candle. And so the use of it, that enhancement technology, that synthetic sunshine was costly. And of course, people who could afford it could have more fun. They could see in the dark, but they could also work in the dark and steal a march on their neighbors. And of course, that possibility is true of all enhancement technologies. And like candles and electric light, they start expensive, but costs come down. And now I think everybody in this room can go home to a house or a flat or a room which is lit by electric light. It's not so elitist anymore. But it still costs. So we shouldn't be frightened of synthetic enhancements. We shouldn't turn our backs on them because we fear that they're elitist or that they will give some people an unfair advantage over others. The thing to do with an unfair advantage is to compensate for that advantage. In the 19th century, we did this by, uh, in, in my country at any rate, by starting the concept of uh, working hours directives, of making, stipulating that people could only work so long, whether they used electric light or not. There are ways around those sorts of problems. So I want to suggest to you that we should not be frightened of synthetic technologies, whether they involve synthetic sunshine or synthetic biology or synthetic gametes or synthetic anything. The desire to better ourselves is not only something that we just have and that we cannot help, it's something that I hope will help us and creatures like us survive. Because it's possible, I think it's highly probable, but that's just a bet, that we may be the only self-conscious intelligent beings in the universe. There's a colleague sitting in the second row who knows much more about this than I do, but a lot of people are out there listening to know whether there are others in the universe. And uh, we haven't heard anything, which is surprising. The uh, American... uh, Astrophysicist, I think he was, Carl Sagan, was very keen on looking for extraterrestrial life. And he was asked by a journalist once, well, we haven't heard anything. What do you think? Are there people out there in the rest of the universe? And he said, I have no idea. And he said, they said, but go on, Carl. You know, what's, what's your gut feeling? And he replied, I try not to think with my gut. Well, that I think is what we should do. We should try not to think with our guts. We should try to use our brains. And we should try to improve our brains so that we can use them more effectively. And there are now very many new ways, both chemical and uh, in terms of neurotransmitters and so on, that we can actually enhance our cognitive functioning quite considerably. There's very good evidence that drugs like Ritalin and Modafinil improve exam performance among students by about 10%. That is enough to make the difference between a pass and fail for a university student or a top class degree, summa cum laude, or a less than top class degree. Um, And uh, with a group of others, uh, We published a paper in Nature in 2008 looking at modafinil and Ritalin and uh, other new drugs and assessing whether or not we should make them available to the general populace for people who want to enhance their cognitive performance. Well, let me conclude.
It is not the function of science to do anything in particular. I agree with my colleague John Salston. The function of science is to find out. But it has wonderful byproducts, and all of us use them all of the time. They are responsible for medical advances, for technological advances, for clean drinking water, and many, many other things that save countless lives and make countless lives better. I think we need to contemplate the possibility of going one or two steps further and improving ourselves to the point where we get smarter, smart enough eventually, to protect ourselves from the dangers that we face. I want to suggest to you, and this is my final and closing remark, that the most urgent and worrying moral, ethical problems surrounding the use of new technology, including synthetic biology, are not the dangers of using such technologies, but the dangers of not using them. There is no safe path. Rescue delayed is rescue denied, and we may all need rescue. The precautionary principle urged on us by the European Union and many others is nonsense. Why? Because you cannot employ the precautionary principle unless you know in which direction caution lies. And standardly, we don't know in which direction safety lies. So doing nothing is never safer than doing something. At least it sometimes is, but it's only an accident uh, post hoc whether we know in which direction caution lies. We have, to ha I believe, to have the courage to take calculated risks. The dangers that have been consistently underestimated are the dangers of not pursuing research because a host of feeble and often incoherent objections and objectors have stood between us and the future. The problem, it seems to me, is not embracing these possibilities, but turning our backs on them. Because perhaps in the end, to borrow the uh, words of the poet T.S. Eliot, an American who lived most of his life in England, because we do not dare disturb the universe. I think we have to disturb the universe. We have to be careful about doing so. We have to be thoughtful about it. But we can't fail. So what is the business of science? The business of science is to enable us all to survive into the future and to find a way of keeping what may be the only intelligent life forms in the universe going until we can develop to the point where we can protect ourselves and eventually build a new habitat, which we know because of the inevitable death of our sun, our sun in the sky, not our biological sun, that we know that we will need such a place. As Karl Marx famously said, and I'm not particularly a Marxist, but he said of philosophy, the purpose of philosophy is not simply to understand the world, but to change it. And I think the same is true of science, that the purpose of science is not to simply understand the world, but to change it. Thank you very much. Beh, una conferenza ricchissima di sollecitazioni, forse a molte cose non eravamo preparati, non le sapevamo e non avevamo, forse non avevamo nemmeno riflettuto su tante opportunità che la scienza prossima ci può, prossima dico perché non dico tanto del futuro, perché certe cose già, e certe potenzialità già esistono, insomma, ecco. Quindi, ecco, sulla base di queste sollecitazioni aspettiamo degli interventi.
Con il professor Battistone, ecco, già rompe bene. You can ask questions in Italian, you know, it's okay. <laughs> bene, allora vogliamo, sì, tanto può parlare in inglese uh, direttamente. Sì. So, you, you made a very strong statement, of course. Apparently, you are supporting science to improve uh, the qualities or physical or intellectual proper qualities of man, mankind. Uh, even uh, without knowing where we are going. Your point is, we, are no, we don't know where we are going. Science is about curiosity. There is a wealth of uh, unknown things about biology. Let's explore that with the wildest possible, without any limitation, okay? Like the people when they want to nuclear science made a nuclear weapon, let's do the same with some de degree of social control, not too much, the least possible, and let's take the risk. Uh, okay, is a, is a, I understand your point, but uh, I think science in reality, I think mankind in reality has a, 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 a relatively weak body, but evolution has created some fantastic object which is our brain. And uh, if we think uh, with respect uh, of the chimpanzee you were mentioning as our ancestor, um, i mean, our brain has managed to survive such incredible amount of changes, especially in the last century, but even before, and still in good shape. We are still capable to deal with a huge amount of information. Maybe us, as old, older human beings, are less capable, but the young generation are more capable than the NASA, still, good, still showing excellent shape in dealing with incredibly complex problems. So I think we don't need 10% more. What we need uh, is more education. And we need uh, to gather together and make a social brain out of our brain. Take the internet and the revolution as a social uh, uh, network and things like that. This is going to change the world. We don't need 10% more. We don't need drug to do that. We need a clean mind, and we need to do it together. This is probably what science should help us in doing. Um, I don't, I think, disagree very much with you. It's, what I would say, though, is that I think we need to try everything. I'm not saying that everybody should be put on drugs to improve their intellectual powers. Uh, but in fact, we are using all sorts of enhancement technologies already, and indeed the collective brain is one example of that, and we can only access that collective brain because we have learned to use little bits of technology like uh, our computers and our mobile phones and our iPads and so on uh, in order to access that. And you, one can think of the Internet as the, the beginnings precisely of that, of that collective consciousness. So we're already using enhancement technologies. Now, um, as it happens, I, I don't use smart drugs, so that, but I, um, I'm convinced that they make a difference And I think people who do want to access them should be able to do so. I also think, for reasons I haven't argued this evening, but I've been thinking a lot about this and writing about it in the last two years, that actually there are a, there's a lot in the neurological literature about so-called moral enhancement, about using um, various sorts of... Uh, particularly neurotransmitters, serotonin, uh, beta blockers, and various other things uh, to enhance our effective life, our uh, pro-social um, attitudes. I think those are mistaken. I think the safest moral enhancement is, in fact, cognitive enhancement, because, in fact, what we need is not more sympathy but more generalized sympathy. And it is only the intellect that enables us to generalize the immediate sympathy we all feel for people in front of our noses, so to speak. So I don't think we disagree. Um, I want us to try everything, but I've, I don't want to make anything mandatory. I'm a libertarian at heart. I want people to be able to choose their own path, but I want them to be able to choose that, not to be stopped by governments or by drugs legislation or whatever it is from doing that. One thing that you said I would take issue with, though, I don't think that um, science should be allowed unfettered growth. I think there are areas where we need to regulate science. 
many people will be familiar with a recent, not that recent, historical example of the pugwash attempts to control, you will be particularly aware of those, to control uh, the use of nuclear weapons. And we're now facing similar um, pressures. I was at a meeting at the Royal Society just about three weeks ago, a two-day meeting on, you, some of you may be familiar in this audience with this, on um, the problem created by two groups, one in Wisconsin and the other at Erasmus University in Rotterdam, to make aerosol versions of H5N1, that's the flu virus, so that it could be transmitted via uh, breathing, so to speak, via sneezing on people between humans. And there was a uh, the, these papers were submitted simultaneously by the Wisconsin group to uh, Nature and by the Erasmus group to Science. And the journal Science submitted this to a committee they have in the United States because of the dangers of bioterrorism. That if you make a variant of flu that can be easily caught simply by sneezing on people, this could be a very effective bioterrorist weapon. And science decided that they should redact, that means they should delete the parts of the paper that would enable that to be duplicated. Now, of course, the essence of science is that you publish precisely to enable people to duplicate your findings to prove whether they really effective or not. And so one of the things this meeting at the Royal Society considered is whether that sort of censorship of scientific material was defensible in the public interest or not. Um, and the meeting didn't come to any conclusions, but we heard, I'll just share this with you because it's intrinsically interesting, we had a very interesting presentation from a cyber security expert who advises the Obama government and this was a meeting of about 200 leading scientists in the Royal Society in London, international. The, nature, the editor of Nature was there, the editor of Science was there, the Wisconsin group was there, the Rotterdam group was there, many people were there. And this cyber expert looked around the room and he said, well, you're now considering whether or not you should publish these papers with bits deleted. How were these papers submitted to your journals? Oh, well, they were submitted online. I'm sorry, guys. It's already too late. They're out there. And all you're doing now is drawing attention to the fact that there is something interesting out there which a determined computer expert, which I, this expert said, could easily access now because I know where to look. So... Uh, in principle, I would say it was probably justified to uh, the phrase redact, delete those sections. But in fact, there's no conceivable way it can be done. And so I, I, by default, we have, open, we have open science. I don't know whether you think that's a good thing or not. But uh, I think by default, we have it, whether we like it or not. Scusi, abbiamo parlato molto di intelligenza. Se facciamo la domanda a, a tutti, cos'è l'intelligenza, avremo circa 100 definizioni diverse. Ci vuol dire qual è la più accettata e principalmente qual è la sua? I don't have a definition of intelligence, um, nor do I think we need one. I think intelligence is... Uh, is multidimensional, but we have various ways of measuring elements of it. Some of those are by exam performance and other sorts of uh, so-called objective tests, but other ways, of course, are by just seeing what people can do. And some people can do things, as it were, with their minds that others cannot solve problems whether they are simple mathematical problems or other sorts of problems. So I don't think we need a, a, a definition of intelligence any more than we need a definition of physical strength. There are many ways in which physical strength might manifest itself, and we want not to exclude any of them. 
but it doesn't follow from the fact that we don't have a unitary definition of intelligence that there is no such thing as intelligence. This is the common logical problem of uh, uh, inconsequential differences. That the addition, for example, of one grain of sand, you put one grain of sand on a table, that is not a pile of sand. You put another one, the addition of one extra grain is never enough to make a pile. But eventually, you go on adding the grains, you'll get a pile. So um, the fact that there are, that it is unclear where the lines should not be drawn, whether between intelligence and lack of intelligence, whatever that may mean, does not show that there is no such thing there. So I'm not, bur not worried about lacking a definition. But I, I, would, I, would, I would say that it is an objective matter that some people in this room are more intelligent than other people in this room. And there are, and you would say, along which dimension? And then we'll have to talk about that. Some people will have more emotional intelligence. Some people will have more artistic intelligence. Some people will have more numerical intelligence, and so on. But there will still be gradations within all of those variants. Otherwise, I know that there are people in this room in interested in education. Among many other things, education is about lots of things, but one of the things I hope it does is improve uh, people's intelligence. It also improves their cognitive abilities, their retention of facts, their memory, their data processing. A whole uh, Cognition has many dimensions. And actually, they're very reliable tests for most of those dimensions. So that, for example, when you're evaluating a drug like Ritalin for its uh, effect on cognitive performance, you want to look at data retention, you want to look at data processing, you want to look at memory. There are a vast range of things that you will look at. And as it happens, many of these drugs improve most of those dimensions. You have spoken about nanomachines before, the, the role of nanomachines in the future. But mm, what does these nanomachines should do in our body exactly, and how? How can these little objects can change our life? I've no idea. I don't know everything, although I like to pretend that I do. Uh, but, some of the, but some of the ways that are uh, proposed are that you, you, for example, you can have, in theory anyway, uh, machines that can give you, as it were, internal, uh, just as the way if you've got a, a smartphone, you can look at your screen and call up data. Well, in principle, it might be possible to access that, direct, that data directly into the brain and thereby obviate, remove the need to have a separate piece of apparatus um, I think it would be very useful, for example, just to access computer memory directly. Um, a colleague of mine in the University of Reading is famous for inserting computer chips <laughs> under his skin. They're rather crude, but they enable him to, uh, to operate things in his home, uh, turn the cooker on when he's driving home and so forth, just by, as it were, willpower. There's a lot of biofeedback mechanisms that enable this sort of thing to be done. It's fairly crude at the moment, but it'll get better. I have a question related to mind. What is your position vis-a-vis -vis your being and your mind? I, Is it you, your mind? I'm smiling because that is the most difficult question in philosophy. Or, but go on. Or is mind a tool for, for us? Um, I think it, for all functional purposes, it makes sense to draw a distinction between brain and mind. So I don't think that uh, mind is reducible to brain activity, although brain activity is clearly a necessary condition for the functioning of mind. Now, that's a very crude way of just saying what my overall position is. So, for example, I don't think that... Um, 
if one is thinking about um, the moral dimensions of the brain, which there's a lot of so-called neuroethics looking at at the moment, I don't think that by, for example, as some of the literature suggests, that increasing serotonin levels in the brain will increase one's disposition to respond sympathetically to others constitutes a moral improvement because I've just written a paper which is called Ethics is for Bad Guys. And the, that paper argues that good people don't need ethics. Ethics principles that tell us how to behave are for bad guys like you and me, not for virtuous people. And why we need it is because things like poverty of the imagination, you know, if you fall over now in pain, I will probably rush to your defense. But I also need to think about the person beyond my sight and hearing who may be in pain and making provision, as we all do, at least in our, your society and mine. We have public provision, we have ambulance services, we have hospital services, which are designed to mobilize the community on behalf of people who are not in front of our noses. So um, I think that the a lot of the, the effective parts of the brain uh, actually uh, require things like imagination and knowledge and rationality to function properly. Um, is the mind reducible to brain activity? No, I don't think so. But I could be wrong about that. But I don't think there is a theory of how the brain functions at the moment that helps us answer your question. So I'm, I'm a... I'm on the mystical side of that, if you like. But I, I could well be wrong. Most of the scientists that I, I know uh, disagree with me about that. Yeah. You have presented us a scenario of the future, which uh, is at the same time a little bit frightened, frightening and also exciting. In any case, what you have done is uh, uh, proposing to us proposing to the science a proactive approach, no? Yes. Not just science yeah. as observing yeah. uh, yeah. the nature, but uh, uh, yeah. changing, really yeah. changing. So my question is about uh, your point of view concerning the political aspect of this uh, uh, issue. I mean, is, in your opinion, the current organization of the society able and well prepared and correctly prepared to, uh, to face the challenges you are uh, telling us, you are proposing, or is, in your opinion, need, needed a change? Uh, I mean, generally speaking, your point of view about uh, the, the organization of the society and the political aspects of this issue? Uh, as you know, that's a very complicated question. My own view... Uh, you know, in one sentence, in 30 words or whatever, is that the adjustments needed to move to the sort of receptivity to new ideas and to new science required us are small. Um, we all rightly have regulatory mechanisms, not only to control science, but to control food safety, car safety, machinery safety. We rightly have regulatory mechanisms in, in all developed societies to try to make the world safer. Many of those are leaning too far in the direction of regulation, particularly of science, indeed particularly of medical science. For example, it's almost impossible now to, in Europe uh, to have a cost-effective drug trial because the uh, the requirements of the EU are far too stringent. We're just pricing ourselves out of benefiting from many good drugs because we can't meet the standards of control. We have to think very seriously about that. So I think the dangers at the moment are in the direction not of under-regulation, but over-regulation. But obviously we have to keep that under review. Now that's a very, you know, I've been very bold in my presentation and that's a very cautious sort of uh, response to your question. But I think that's the reality. Uh, exactly on this point, uh, I would like to take, uh, make two examples. 
why some regulations may be needed, okay? And I'd like to have your opinion on that. So the, the, one, the first one is, uh, is, the issue is always biology, okay? The first one, when we manipulate uh, organism, creating synthetic lives, even at the very sim uh, simple, simple forms, uh, uh, the fear is uh, that we are ignorant enough about the overall environment uh, that we can mess up irreversibly uh, the, the ecological system as an example. So just in, in exchange of a freedom of research, uh, we have may start processes which are completely out of control. And the chances of doing that uh, may be so high that we better think carefully before playing with these kind of games. This is one point. So I would like to hear your answer to that. When we come to much uh, more evoluted uh, uh, system of animals, let's take, you mentioned about combination of species. Uh, I think humankind has uh, a very strong empathy versus similar beings. And as a very strong uh, 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 hesitation in creating uh, other beings uh, which uh, uh, may be uh, uh, either different or less performant or even more performant in certain aspects uh, but a disaster in other areas. Uh, because we bring from the, our ancient, uh, ancient history a feeling uh, not to try on our I mean, uh, member of our mankind. And the thing this has nothing to do with religion, has nothing to do with uh, ideology, is deeply rooted in, that, in us. So I would like to ask you about these two extreme cases, the very simple form out of control and the resistance we have against manipulating ourselves. Sure. Um, on the first case first, I mean, I, I would like to discuss cases in more detail with you, but that's just an evasion. Uh, in broad terms, uh, there is a big difference between um, discovery and innovation. So my, my view is that discovery should pretty much be unfettered, but we do want to think carefully about what we then, as it were, mass produce or, or uh, try to generalize, for example, in the form of uh, you know, anything from manipulating crops to manipulating viruses and so forth. So I, would, I, I think we can sensibly distinguish between, as it were, the discovery end, which is pretty much the hard science end, and then the, uh, the, the process of proof of principle through to innovation and products in the clinic and the marketplace. And it's at that point that we want to be very satisfied, at least as, as satisfied as we can be, uh, that whatever we're doing is safe. But nothing is, you know, nothing is safe. I, 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 I think the right way to think about it, is it safe enough? And of course, we can be wrong about that. But again, the point I made at the end of my talk, that we can be wrong the other way too, and it can be just as dangerous to delay putting something into production that might benefit people. So we have to make a, a hard calculation. On the other question, and I don't pretend that it's easy, and we won't get it right, but we're as likely to get it as right in my direction, if you like, the less cautious than in the more cautious direction. On the other one, um, well, I'm skeptical about the value of empathy understood as a feeling, as it were, as an emotional reaction, rather than an analysis of how that feeling should be generalized. But one of the things we might do is not try to remove, and I don't think it would be sensible. I, I, I'm a very emotional person. I cry at the drop of a sad movie. Uh, and I don't want to lose that emotionality. So I'm not a Dr. Spock in Star Wars. Um, but actually, the other alternative is much more likely. What is more likely is that actually we could, um, we could enhance animals so that their affective side was increased rather than our, our affective side diminished. I think we humans need to be smarter, and possibly animals and other creatures need to be more effective. Now, there's a, it's very difficult to get people to think carefully about whether or not 
we should enhance animals. And this again is something uh, my colleagues and I are working on in Manchester at the moment. But if you think about it this way, that um, human, humans start out as human animals. And gradually, through socialization and education, their, as it were, their moral side is enhanced, largely by education and by socialization and by example, the example of love and caring. Now, uh, we think we have a moral duty to do that to young human animals when they're six months, one year, 18 months old. We believe we ought to start that process because it is in their interest to be enhanced in that way. Now, if that's true of human children, why would it not be true of animals? So in other words, it may be that what we should consider more carefully is the possibility not of uh, uh, brutalizing humans, but of uh, humanizing animals in their own interests, not in our interests, not so they make better food, but in their own interests. That might be one thing we should think about. Another thing to think about, I mean, so yours is a very good question, and this is where we get into really tricky ground, is what are the fail-safe mechanisms? Now, there is a very eminent British stem cell scientist who is interested in theory in populating a mouse brain with human brain cells. Now, the best guess is that that won't make any difference because the best guess is actually that the, uh, that the context will actually turn them into mouse brain cells rather than the mouse brain into human. But still, we don't really know the answer. Now, you could do that experiment harmlessly as long as you applied the same uh, ethics that some of the European countries have about termination of pregnancy, about abortion, or indeed the same ethics uh, as we apply to animals. You could do that experiment, watch what happens, and if it looked like getting out of control, you could end the life of that creature if you thought that that was an ethical thing to do. So it depends what you think are the legitimate fail-safe mechanisms that you could employ. And one reason for not doing that experiment might well be that insofar as it was human, we couldn't actually employ the fail-safe mechanism that we might employ if we were satisfied that it was an animal in many of our societies. There's a poser. Anyway, there's not much of a good scientific reason for doing that experiment. Anybody in this, you're mostly familiar with Ali G, I hope. Ali G, the film character? No, perhaps not. Anyway, Ali G is famous for uh, his mate Dave, who put a cat in the microwave just to see what would happen. Now, we tend not to operate with that principle of science. We don't just do things just to see what would happen. We have to have a hypothesis, by and large, that we're testing in order to justify putting the cat in the microwave. So I'm not suggesting that we either do this experiment or put the cat in the microwave. I've exhausted them, or rather they've exhausted themselves. Are you waiting to ask a question? No. Si sente, ah, sì, sì. No, dico, dicevo che ero certo che avrebbe sollecitato il professor Harris tante questioni, anche perché, come ho detto anche in premessa, il professore ha sollecitato anche de, dei problemi eh, che possono coinvolgere la dimensione etica del nostro vivere, la nostra dimensione sociale, eh, sono per certi versi anche inquietanti, ma è vero che dobbiamo fare anche diciamo i, le nostre considerazioni con quelli che sono gli sviluppi attuali della scienza che indubbiamente pongono delle problematiche nuove che, che 
mettono diciamo, anche un po' a repentaglio anche il, la, la, nostra, la dimensione della, della specie umana, insomma, ecco. Io mi auguro personalmente che queste cose possano avvenire più tardi possibile perché sono portato un po' a considerare, penso come anche molti di voi, a quella che è la dimensione dell'uomo nella sua anche stabilità, devo dire, anche nel, eh, nel recupero di quella che è la tua propria autentica dimensione umana che lo caratterizza dagli altri, dagli altri esseri. Ma ecco, so, naturalmente questa è la mia opinione, insomma, non so che ne pensa il professor Harris di questo, forse non ha seguito, forse non ha seguito questo personalmente perché non aveva la... Bene, ma erano soltanto delle considerazioni immagino conclusive perché se non ci sono eh, altre osservazioni ritengo che possiamo concludere questa serata, ringrazio il professor Harris per il suo contributo diciamo senz'altro ricco di testimonianza e di cultura e di sollecitazioni e, e quindi abbiamo, facciamo tesoro di, questa, di, questi suoi, di questi suoi contributi. Grazie a tutti, buonasera.